Okay, welcome back. Feels like it's been a while. Um, so, so we're going to switch topics now. Not too much, a little bit. Um, let me tell you the next thing that I would like to do. So, here's our next big goal for the class. What I want to do is, is the following. I want to, I want to show you a correspondence. I want to show you a, another word, another way of understanding the reduced words in a Coxeter group. And the way that we are going to understand them is that we're going to build a graph in such a way that the reduced words of the group correspond exactly to walking around the graph. So let me show you what I mean by this in an example. And uh, I think the example will be more, expressive, more impressive if I do this for an infinite group. Because then there's going to be infinitely many words. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to build for you a finite graph. So instead of walking in this finite graph in every way possible, it's going to give me exactly the reduced words in my group. But we have to start not too hard, so let me show you an unimpressive infinite group. So, so here is, in a sense, the, the smallest infinite Coxeter group that we know. And uh, so the, we know exactly what the reduced words are. Basically, the only way that we can reduce words in this group is by canceling AA or BB, because those are the only two relations that we have here. And so the, redu the reduced words are exactly the ones that alternate. So it's either the empty word, or A, or B, or AB, or BA, or ABA, BAB, etc. There's, there's basically two kinds of words that are reduced, this kind and this kind. For every possible length. And uh, so let me build for you a graph, a very small graph that encodes this. The graph that I'm going to build is going to look like this. There's a vertex called the start, and there's two more vertices. Okay, It's a directed graph, and it's going to have edges like this to here, from here to here, and then an edge like this, and an edge like this, okay? And I'm going to label the edges A, B, A, B, okay? Now let's see what happens when I walk around this graph in every way possible, starting at the start. You either start with A or you start with B. So I'm, I'm going to Consider paths in this, in this graph, and then I'm going to see what are the uh, letters that I encounter along those edges. So the first letter is, well, either I could stay still, that would correspond to the empty word, or I could start walking by either going to A or by going to B. Let's say I start with A. Now I find myself here, and now I can either stay put or go to B. Then I can either stay put or go to A. Stay put or go to B or go to A. And so the only, the only things that I can do starting in this way is go A, B, A, B, A, B, A, and then just stop whenever I want to stop. It's going to give me all the words that look like this. And if I want the words that look like this, then I do the same thing, but starting with B. And then I go B, A, B, A, B. And so this little graph tells us the whole story about this, this group in a way. And it gives us a very nice way of understanding what the reduced words are. And so this is what I want to build in general, but it's going to take some work to do this. I mean, you, you can imagine this is not a trivial construction. And so, so this will take some work. And so 
what we're going to do is first I'm going to define for you something called the root poset. Once I've defined for you the root poset, so this is going to be a poset on the roots of my group. Once I have that, then I can tell you what the small roots are. Okay. Basically, if you have the roots of a coxeter group, then they're either small or not small, according to uh, something that I will tell you. And then those small roots are going to be very important in building this, this graph. Okay. Um, now, this is called automaticity. And people like to refer to this result as saying that Coxeter groups are automatic. Okay. What they mean when they say this is, is basically what I'm telling you here. Basically, this, this means, for example, that it would be very easy to tell a computer uh, how to decide if a word is reduced or not, because you can just as soon as you have this graph, then you can just feed it to a computer, and, and then it becomes very easy. Okay. So this is the kind of the big goal that we have for the next maybe week and a half. And so we're going to start with step one, which is to tell you about the root poset. Okay. That's our goal for today. But uh, it's been over a week and a half since we've talked. And so let me, let me remind you even what a root is and all these things that we haven't done in a while. So let me give you a little, a little reminder of how all of this goes. So remember, we started with a Coxeter group. And we started with a set of generators, S1 up to S. <coughs> Now, for each one of these generators, we build a root. Let me call these alpha 1 up to alpha n. I call these the simple roots. And I think that they form a basis for some vector, sp vector space, basis for v, some n-dimensional vector space. Um, and then I have this inner product in V that is a little bit unusual. We know that the inner product of alpha i and alpha j is minus the cosine of pi over m i j. What's m i j? Well, remember that alpha i corresponds to s i, alpha j corresponds to s j, and for every pair of generators, you have an exponent for SISJ. So this MIJ is the order of SISJ in the group. Okay. <clears throat> now, I, I mentioned to you that sometimes we can actually pull this off in Euclidean space. In fact, exactly when the group is finite, we can pull this off in Euclidean space. Okay. And so, in the last homework, I recommended strongly an exercise where for the first time you encountered a three-dimensional root system. And so this is the three-dimensional root system for the symmetric group S4, which all of you thought about. And that's good because now I can draw this and you know what I mean. But let's, let's do this slowly. So here we have a cube. Now, I can choose three midpoints of edges of the cube, which, let me label them. Uh, let's see how I label them in my notes. Here's number one. Here's number two. And here is number three. Okay. And you're supposed to think that, for example, 1 is really just alpha 1. I just want to keep the alphas out of the picture so we can actually see something. Okay? So these are alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. Now, the origin is at the center of the cube. And so what you, what you checked in your homework is that 
this alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 are actually Euclidean vectors in R3 that have the correct angles. Yeah. So they really satisfy uh, the inner product that we want them to satisfy. Okay? So we start with these three roots. Okay? And we know that each one of these roots defines a reflection. Okay? And in this case, we know what those reflections are, and it takes a little while to, to look at this picture and see them. But for example, here's root 1, and the hyperplane perpendicular to root 1 is this brown plane right here. So I hope the color is showing in the video, but can you guys see the color? So the, there's, you know, this is brown and it has a brown hyperplane. Then the blue guy is perpendicular to this blue hyperplane, and the red guy is perpendicular to this red hyperplane. Okay. Again, this is a picture that one has available in, in the finite case. In the infinite case, we know it's a little bit trickier. But... Uh, but this is just a good visual aid for, for what I'm going to do from now on. Okay. So what do you do then? Well, what you do is that then you start bouncing these roots around according to what these reflections allow you to do. And that's what's called the root system. Right? So this root system phi is given by letting the group elements act on roots. So takes on any group element, you let it operate on any one of these simple roots, and we get the root system. Okay. And so let's let's go ahead and do that over here. For example, if I I don't know, if I take the hyperplane one and I reflect it a, across the brown hyperplane, sorry, if I take vector one I reflect that across the brown hyperplane, I end up in this back midpoint right here. Okay. If I take this blue guy and I reflect it across the red plane, I end up at this midpoint over here. Now if I take this guy and I reflect it across the brown hyperplane, I end up at this midpoint over here. If I reflect across the red one, I end up with this one. And so if you keep doing this, what you're going to find is that you get exactly the midpoints of the edges of the cube. I think that's all right. Yeah. So there's, there's 12 roots. Okay. Now, what we said after that is that, so here it has 12 roots. And these 12 roots are always classified as either being positive or negative. And the way you do that is that 1, 2, and 3 are a basis for your space. Every root can be written as a combination of 1, 2, and 3. And the nice fact about this is that when you do that, Either all the coefficients are positive, you get positive times 1 plus positive times 2 plus positive times 3, or they're all negative. And so that, def that divides the roots into positive and negative roots. Okay. So this gives me a decomposition of phi into phi plus and phi minus. Okay. Positive roots, negative roots, disjoint union. So what are the positive roots over here? Well, you have to stare at this for a while to see them. But when you do it, you find that it's this one, this one, this one, and that's it, and, and these three. Now. Actually, one thing that I didn't ask you to do in the homework, and I wonder if you did it, was to figure out how to write these guys as a linear combination of 1, 2, and 3. We know that it's possible. So for example, how, how do you write this in terms of 1, 2, and 3? Did anybody do that? I didn't ask you to do it, but maybe you noticed. Yeah? So what did you get? So this is exactly alpha 1 plus alpha 2. And this is exactly alpha 2 plus alpha 3. And this is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3. And you have to do it. I mean, you have to really do it carefully. But you're going to find that uh, the positive roots are 
they're basically alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 1 plus alpha 2, alpha 2 plus alpha 3, and alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3. And there they are. The other ones are the negative ones. Okay. Now, remember, we, it took us a while to prove a bunch of things about this root representation, but there are some very important things that, that I asked you to, to remember. And here they are. So one important fact about this. We have a correspondence between positive roots and uh, reflections. A one-to-one -one correspondence. And if a positive root is obtained as W acting on alpha i, then the corresponding reflection is W S i W inverse. Okay. It's a very important fact. Um, another very important fact is that if you want to know whether W takes, let's say that you take a positive root, and you want to know whether W takes that positive root to a positive or to a negative root. Well, we know that this geometric property can be also characterized in terms of the length function. Because this root is a positive root. It has a corresponding reflection, t alpha. And you just have to figure out if multiplying by t alpha makes w longer or shorter. Okay. So this is the, the dictionary between the geometry and the combinatorics. And the third thing is that if you take the positive roots and you want to know wh how many positive roots become negative when you apply W to them, we know that that number is exactly the length of W. So these are, these are three important facts that we need to keep in mind. Okay. And so what I want to know now in thinking about this root post set, I want to think about the following question. If I, if I look at my positive roots, how hard is it to send them to negative roots? using reflections. Okay. In other words, how many reflections do I need? So this is called the depth of a root. The depth of a root beta, which is positive, is the minimum length of an element of the group such that that group element makes beta negative. That's the depth of a positive root. How many simple reflections do you need to make it negative? Okay. So let's go to this picture and compute depth. I'm really struggling as to what to actually write in this picture and what not to write. So for now, I'm going to call this, I'm going to erase this later because there will be too many things in this picture. But for now, I want to actually label these things. Okay, these are the roots alpha 1 plus alpha 2, alpha 2 plus alpha 3, alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3. And let's compute depths. So. <coughs> 
So what, what is the depth of these guys? Simple roots. Well, it, it's one, right? Because you only need one reflection, and you're, you're already negative. Yeah? The brown reflection makes one negative. The blue reflection makes two negative. The red reflection makes three negative. So, so I'm going to put depth in a little circle. So these guys have depth one. How about alpha 1 plus alpha 2, which is this guy right here? How many reflections do you need to make it negative? Well, so you say it's 2. So if you tell me that it's 2, then you have to show me two things. First, how to do it in two steps. And second, you have to show me that you can't do it in one step. So how do you send this to a negative root in two steps? Tell me the colors. So you mean the brown? and then the blue. So I take this guy, I reflect it across the brown, and I get this one, I reflect it across the blue, and I become negative. So I can definitely do it in two steps. The question is, can I, can I do it in only one step? Well, you could just try, OK? If you, if you want to do it in one step, there's only three ways to do it. Try with the brown. The brown makes you positive. Try with the red. The red makes you positive. Try with the blue. The blue makes you positive. Right. So that means that you really do have depth too. Okay. Now, what about this one? Well, maybe you see that actually there's there's this is perfectly symmetric. Yeah, this picture is perfectly symmetric in one and three. If you just kind of reflect across a mirror like this, and this makes perfect sense because the Coxeter diagram is also symmetric in one and three. So if this thing has depth 2, then this thing is also going to have depth 2, just by the symmetry of the picture. How about alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3? You need three reflections. Which three? For example, I could go to the brown, sends me here, the red sends me here, and the blue sends me here. Negative. Can I do it in two steps? How do I know that I cannot do it in two steps? Because if I reflect over the brown, I end up with something of depth 2. So I can't get there in just one more step. If I reflect with the red, I end up with something with depth 2. And if I reflect across, across the blue, I stay put. Okay. So that's a, that's a very good way to, to see it. Depth is a kind of a recursive thing. Okay. So that's how you define depth. and if I ask you to define a poset on these guys, on these six elements, then I think you would know what to do. So I'll let you think about that while I. I'll let you think about what is the right poset to define on these six elements. Think about that for a while while I prove a couple of other things about this. But before, before I talk about the root poset in itself, I want to convince you that this depth function, which, I don't know, to me it sounds a little mysterious the way that I'm describing it. And it really feels like you have to kind of look at the picture and do it. But I want to show to you that this depth function is not mysterious. Actually, you, you know it already. You just don't know that you know it. So let beta be a positive root. And this positive root corresponds to a reflection, right? So let's call that reflection T sub beta, corresponding reflection. So what I'm going to show to you, by the way, this thing is called dP of beta. That's how we denote it. Okay. And What I'm going to show is that the depth of beta is basically just the length of the corresponding reflection. It's not exactly. It's this plus 1 over 2. Okay. Now, first of all, how do we know that this is an integer? Well, remember that reflections always have odd length plus 1 is even, divided by 2. 
this might be okay, this theorem might be true. At least the depth is an integer according to this theorem, but we're going to prove that it's exactly, this is exactly right. Okay? Now again, this might seem a little bit mysterious, so let me demystify this, this expression for you. The thing is that we have a root, okay? Now by definition, what is a root? Well, a, a root is just a group element acting on one of the alpha i's. So let's write it in this way. Now, we know by now that there might be different ways of, of doing this, right? But let's do it in the shortest way possible. Okay? So then what is, what is the corresponding reflection? Well, the corresponding reflection, according to this, is just W S I W inverse. Okay? And so when I look at this number, half of the length of T of beta plus 1, what am I really saying? Well, you see the length of T beta is just 2 times the length of W plus 1. And so what this number means is just the length of W plus 1. Okay? So that makes this number less mysterious. So what I want to show is that the depth of beta is the length of W plus 1. And so if I want to prove that, I have to show you two things. First thing I have to do is show to you that in this number of steps, I can make beta negative. And the second thing I have to show you is that I cannot do it in fewer steps. So, first thing, I can make beta negative in this many steps. Okay, so how am I going to do that? Well, beta, I want to put something times beta and get a negative thing. Okay? A group element of length length of w plus 1. Okay? Let's substitute here. Beta is w times alpha i. And I want to put something here of length l of w plus 1, and I want this to be negative. You see there actually aren't a lot of choices here. How do you make a word of length l of w plus 1? Well, it's probably taking w and then something, or taking w inverse and something. And what do we know that is, I mean, I don't know, do you see it? Do you see what I should put here? What should I put here? I should put S I W inverse. <coughs> w inverse and W cancel, and I get S I alpha I, which is negative alpha I. So that gets me there in the correct number of steps. So that's good. Um, and what that shows is that the depth of my root is at most this number. I can get there in, the, in that number of steps. Okay. Now I have to show that I cannot get there in fewer steps. Okay. So let's suppose that I do. Well, let's say that I take something like this, S A, S B up to S Z, which takes beta and makes it negative. Okay? And this right here is the depth of beta. Okay? So what am I going to do? I'm going to say the following. This is this is the depth of beta, right? So this is the shortest, this is a shortest word that I could put here to make this negative. So what that means is that you can tell me something about this guy right here, this orange guy. Because this is shorter, that means that this expression cannot be negative because that would be shorter, okay? So that means that this is positive, okay? 
So here you have a positive root that SA makes negative. How many positive roots does SA make negative? Just one, right? Because it's exactly the length of SA. SA is a generator. So the only root that is positive that SA makes negative is alpha A. Okay? So it means that I know exactly what this thing is. S B dot 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 S Z beta is nothing but alpha A. Okay. Now that means that here I have two roots. They're both alpha A. Now each root has a corresponding reflection. What is the corresponding reflection? Well, according to this side, the corresponding reflection to alpha A is just SA, right? I'm taking the corresponding reflections. So the, the reflection corresponding to alpha A is SA. What's the co reflection corresponding to this thing? Well, it's what that says, is take this times this times this inverse. So it's SB up to SZ times the reflection corresponding to beta times this thing inverse. OK? Now let me solve for T beta. So first I have to get rid of all of this mess on the left. So what I get is SZ up to SB. Then I get this SA. And then I get SB up to SZ. OK? So what have I just done? I have found an expression in terms of generators for T beta. How long is this expression? Well, this is the depth of beta is going from A to Z. And here I'm going from A to Z twice, except that I'm not repeating SA. So this is 2 times the depth of beta minus 1. Okay. So I found a word for t beta of this length. What that means is that the length of t beta is either this or something smaller. Either this is reduced, or I reduce it and I get something shorter. So I get this, equal this inequality. Okay. But now, if you look at this inequality, and you look at this inequality, you see that they say exactly the same thing, but they point in the opposite ways. This says the length of t beta is bigger than 2 times the depth minus 1, and this says that it's smaller than 2 times the depth minus 1, so that means they're equal. I like this proof. This is nice. Any questions about it? Okay. So this this question of how many how much bouncing around you have to do to become negative, actually we know the answer already. It's just the length of the corresponding reflection over two, basically. Okay. Okay, so now if I force you to make a post-it out of these guys, what are you going to do? What are the lowest elements? The roots. Wait, which roots? The simple roots, right? So I'm going to make a post-it out of these guys where the lowest elements are the simple roots. So here they are. One, then two, then three, okay? And so if you're, if you're going to do it that way, then probably what you're going to do is go up with depth, right? So that means that probably these guys are going to go on level two. Where are you going to put this guy? Alpha one plus alpha two is bigger than what? If I, if I make you choose, you probably are going to 
choose the natural thing, which is to do this. And this one, if I ask you where to put it, you're probably going to put it here. And where are you going to put this one? Well, it's level three, so probably it's going to go up here. And you're going to want to make it like this. I think that's, I think that's the natural pose set that we should put at least on, on this guy. Okay? And that's the correct answer. This is, this is the root pose set. What is the root pose set in general? Well, let's go back to what Amanda was telling me. How did I know that this guy had depth 3? Because when I reflected it with the simple roots, then where is it? Here. I wanted to know the depth of this guy, so I just reflected it across the, sim the, the hyperplanes. The blue hyperplane left me alone. The brown hyperplane sent me to 2 plus 3. And the red hyperplane sent me to 1 plus 2. And so maybe I should actually be coloring these guys blue and, sorry, brown. I guess this should be brown. This is important, by the way. This is not just aesthetic. Okay? Um, I really do want to think of these things as colored. And uh, then the red hyperplane sends me over here. Okay. What about 1 plus 2? Where is it? It's right here. So the brown hyperplane sends you to the blue guy. And what else? The blue hyperplane sends you to 1. And then I should have a third guy which for the red hyperplane. It sends me to the higher guy, so actually that sends me up higher up in the post set. Okay. And when I take 2 plus 3, the red guy sends me to the blue guy. And the blue guy sends me to the red guy. Okay. And so this is basically what I want to imitate in the general situation. So where should I go? Let's go? Let's go right here. Definition. The root pose set is going to be a pose set whose elements are the positive ones. And it is defined by saying, I'm just going to tell you what the covering relations are. Okay. So remember that when I, when I write something like this, a less than sign with a little dot in the middle, what I mean is that beta is less than gamma, and there is no element squeezed in between them. So it's exactly the edges that I draw in the diagram of the post -it. Yeah. Um, it makes sense to put a minimal element like an identity so that you know, the depth could be countered by the loss along the edge. So your question is whether I should put here a, a kind of a fictitious uh, level 0. Um, you know, the, it's a good point. Sometimes you want to do it, and sometimes you don't. And very often, in, I mean, if you've, if you've studied a lot of post sets, very often post sets have a top element and a bottom element, and sometimes there's good reasons for that. Um, here, we, I mean, of course, it, again, it, it's, it's also not such an important choice because if you have a bottom element, then you can either put it in or take it out. Here, at least as far as I know, there's, there's not really a, a use for having a bottom element, and so we don't do it, but we could, and sometimes. For example, for topological reasons, people want to put a lower a lower element, but here we won't. We're just gonna we're just gonna make it be the roots only, the positive roots. Well, and the depth could be calculated by actually counting the, the length of the path of the, of the bottom element to any, any kind of floor. That yeah. So the, the virtue of the right. So here it is also except you just have to remember that the lower the, the lowest thing has depth one, and then if you want to know what what depth you are, you just see how many steps it takes you to get up there, starting at 1 instead of starting at 0. So it's a little awkward. But. 
So what am I saying? Well, I'm saying that beta is less than gamma if basically there is this reflection that sends me from here to here and increasing depth. Okay. So if and only if gamma can be obtained by uh, reflecting beta in such a way that depth increases. For one of the generators. Okay. That's the, my root posit. Okay. So that's what it is in this case. And let me start by making a couple of trivial observations about this poset. Well, you see, that the first observation, we, we said it already, this poset is graded, it's graded by depth. I guess it's graded by depth minus one, as Eric is pointing out. Um, why? Because built in the covering relation, I'm saying that in a covering relation, this guy always has height this plus one. And this comes with a natural edge labeling. Uh, we label edges, the edge between beta and gamma should be labeled by the reflection that's, that gets you there. And that's why I was telling you that this is not just an aesthetic choice of what pretty colors I want to put here. It is useful to know what exactly is the reflection that is, that is sending me up and down this edge. Okay. And there's a very natural choice. Now, so let me just tell you some nice things about this root post. So here's a fact. Actually, this is an ex a nice exercise. Um, what do you think the root post set of the symmetric group looks like? Well, at least if, you, if you're going to look at this and try to generalize it again, there's only one thing that you can imagine. That it is, looks like this. It's like this, and then who knows how many levels there are. But it really does always look exactly like that. So that's a nice combinatorial fact. Um, there's a nice reason that I want to tell you this, which is the following. Um, let's think about the anti-chains in this poset. Okay. So what's anti-chain? It's, it's some points so that uh, no, no element, no, a set of elements so that no two are comparable. Okay. So. Terrible. Here's the root poset of S something, maybe S six, I don't know how many. Okay. So what does an anti chain of this poset look like? Well, you take some elements so that no two are comparable. Maybe something like this. OK. Now let's say that I want to find out. This is also a combinatorial class. So how many, how many anti-chains does this root poset have? <coughs> well, let me show you one way to think about this. For for each anti-chain, you can consider the shadow below it. 
everything that is below those elements, below one of those elements. Okay? So what is below one of those elements? Well, these guys are below, then these guys are below, these guys are below, okay, something like this. Now, if I, have some, if I have some landscape like this, I get an anti-chain also. What is the anti-chain that I get? You know, for, for any, any little landscape that I give you, just look at the highest guys. That's an anti-chain. Okay. So that means that the number of anti-chains is exactly the number of landscapes that look like this. Okay. But if you now look at this, like this you realize that what you're doing is just taking a walk from here to here, taking steps that look like this or like this, and never crossing the x-axis. So maybe you're familiar with that, what that question is. This is the number of, I mean, th these paths are exactly called dick paths. They're, they're exactly the, the paths that take steps uh, northeast and southeast and they never cross the x-axis. And they start here, and they end here, and this is one of the most famous combinatorics problems. The answer is the world famous Catalan number. Catalan number CN minus one, which is one over n times, it's this. Now, I should warn you, if you haven't seen this before, you're not supposed to just look at this number and know that this counts this. Okay? This is, this is a, something that takes a bit of effort to prove. But the point is that you know, in, in, any common, in any kind of first undergraduate combinatorial class, this is something that they should teach you. And the reason is that the Catalan numbers just appear all over the place. Um, in fact, you saw Richard Stanley was, was visiting um, a couple of weeks ago, and he, he, I think he mentioned this during his talk, that he has a compilation of, I think, something like 150 problems, combinatorial problems, whose answer is the Catalan number. So these Catalan numbers appear everywhere. Um, now, why am I mentioning all of this? Well, first of all, because it's fun, but second of all, because... You know, here we're just talking about Sn, right? We're talking about the number of anti-chains of the root poset of Sn. Okay. But now we have other root posets. So you could ask exactly the same question for any Coxeter group. So, You know, you could ask, what is the number of anti-chains in the root poset of W? And whatever this number is, we would like to call it the Catalan number of W. The W Catalan number. That means that we're going to have a, a Catalan number for each Coxeter group. Now, how good is this definition? Well, basically, if we can prove a lot of theorems about these numbers, then this is a good definition. And if we cannot, then this is a bad definition. I told you that there's about 100 theorems about the Catalan numbers. And so then the natural question is, can you, can you do this for an arbitrary Coxeter group? Yeah. For each one of those 100 things that you can do over there, can you find analogous objects that you can associate to a Coxeter group? So that you have a hundred different problems about Coxeter groups that give you the same answer, which is these W Catalan numbers. Now I should tell you that this, this is a very new definition. This definition is maybe five years old. But already there are several natural generalizations of things that happen in, in the symmetric group that you can do here. And there are many problems whose answer is this Catalan number, this W Catalan number. And this is a very, very active area of research. Really, people are kind of writing theses on this and writing articles on, about this. And, and so, as you can see, this is this is something that I hope someone does a research on because it's a it's a very 
interesting and very active part of Cox okay. So let's stop there, and, uh, and we'll say more about root process next time. Did you mess it up again? Me? No, it just never got better. Oh, man. Um, I mean, it, it's a little better. It's just... Well, I mean... Cold these, huh? My dog jumped on it the other day and it hurt me. How big is your dog? He's pretty big. Yeah. He's holding that tree for so it's like 100 pounds.